Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, can you hear me? Just give me a quick, we can hear you, George. That would be awesome. It's the first time I've done a live stream using this technique, so very exciting. Can anyone hear me? Looking fine. Great. Okay, awesome. 60 people watching already, 12 likes already. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. If you do enjoy the content at any time, do hit the like button. Uh, it triggers YouTube to uh, make the video more available to everyone around the world, which executes my mission of promoting aquascaping uh, as far and wide as possible. So do consider hitting the like button if you do enjoy the content. That would be awesome. And you can share the, the link as well. That would be even more awesome. Okay, so it is Scape School Sunday. I'm trying to do this once a month, the last... Uh, Sunday of Sunday of every month, although we are that the first Sunday of this month, um, and it's just a a way for me to hopefully drop some knowledge for you guys, gives you guys a chance to ask some questions. Um, this particular episode is going to be very kind of free flowing, um, and I've got a few topics in mind. But equally, if you do want to ask some questions, I will check out the comments every so often, and it I'll answer as many of you as I can okay so let's just have a quick hello to people starting from the top there's so many of you already I really appreciate it tank tested hello mate really good to see you water wizard Jake Sidscape I squish worms Shane Hewlett Wasso lol Lee Harrison Johnny's reef tank ginger graves Billy Barrett snow Akala Ak freezer Dominic Kaber me Michael ZX Billy OC, Grigos, Candy, Overhauls, hello, Julie, Kernahan, hello, everyone. There's so many of you that I recognize from my regular commenters on my channel. So welcome to everyone, but particularly welcome to those that comment regularly on my videos. I really do appreciate that. And it's really great to engage with this community. So um, let's talk about planted tanks. And I wanted, to, first of all, to really go back to basics and discuss why we should keep plants in the first place in an aquarium. Um, I'm not sure how much you guys know about aquarium plants, but to cut to put it really simply, they are awesome, uh, awesome for a planted tank system, uh, an aquarium system, and they're great for uh, for a few reasons. Number one is they produce oxygen, so all living things need well, the vast majority of living things need oxygen, and the fish will benefit, but not only the fish, the bacteria as well. So these higher oxygen levels really do enrich the whole health of the aquarium system. So secondly, they remove harmful toxins. They remove um, potentially harmful nutrients, including ammonia and ammonium, and nitrite and nitrate from the water column, which promotes uh, better water quality to improve your fish health and uh, you know long-term kind of health and anecdotal evidence i mean i have never i can hand on heart say i've never suffered from a fish disease ever since i kept heavily planted aquariums um the vast majority of fish breeders will have some form of plants in there whether it's floating plants or really simple you know epiphyte plants etc so they provide huge amounts of benefits for the aquarium system and what else can we talk about shelter and security so you know they provide areas for the fish to lay eggs. They just provide more kind of shelter and shade from the light. And a heavily planted aquarium, you'll see the fish typically display much more coloration, much bolder behavior, much more naturalistic behavior. And they just feel more comfortable in a, in a planted tank. Now, arguably, you could get that same effect with plastic plants. But I would argue, you know, the plastic plants obviously don't grow. They don't evolve. They don't remove any of these you know, nutrients. They don't produce oxygen. So the benefits are huge. Other benefits, what else? They produce oxygen through the roots as well. So it will prevent your substrate from going stagnant. Uh, floating plants produce oxygen through the roots into the water column. So you'll get a, a more oxygen rich water. And they're just they're just great guys. If you don't have a planted tank, I guess most of you have right now got a planted tank and that's maybe one of the reasons you're watching. But if you don't have a planted tank or if you're not heavily planted, there is a big difference between you know, a tank with plants and a planted tank, I would recommend really going down that heavily planted route. 
Another, another reason you should keep plants and if you keep them healthy is it helps keep algae away. So I talk about this a lot and I've, I've done a lot of workshops recently. I've hammered this point home and I think it's a really important point to note is that the aquarium is like a war zone, like a battle zone going on always between the plants and the algae. So plants are what we call a higher plant and algae is a lower plant. And they're always in competition with each other. So to put it very simply, the more plants you have, and the better you look after those plants, the less algae you'll get. Conversely, if you only have a few plants or those plants are unhealthy, very easy for algae to get the upper hand. Algae is very adaptable. Um, and if you, know, if you don't have enough plants and they're not healthy, then you will encourage algae. Because let's face it, uh, to, to keep a, a, a plant a tank, typically you'll be using you know, decent light levels, uh, nutrient levels, and without decent plant growth, that those light, that light, that light and the nutrients are going to encourage algae. So it's really important to invest in good quality plants to start with. And then when you, especially when you're starting out with a plant tank, you know, don't be shy. Don't, you know, a lot of people will spend, you know, a few hundred dollars, a few hundred pounds on, a, on an aquarium system. And then they'll only spend like 10 or 20 on the plants. Now I would spend, on a typical system, you know, I would be spending probably half of the amount on the entire system on the plants because if you don't, if you don't start off with that real high density of, of healthy plants, then you're just going to end up with a losing battle with algae, especially in those early days when algae is really kind of common. So don't be shy, you know, do invest in good quality plants. Now, my favourites, uh, they have been for a while now, are the Tropica 1-2 Grow range. Some of you may have heard of this. Hopefully, it's available in your country. We are available now in North America. We have a facility now in Vancouver, uh, Tropica, where your retailer will be able to buy direct from uh, the North American facility in Vancouver. So you can be guaranteed to get fresh plants. So a lot of people did struggle. Uh, I think the only kind of one of the biggest sort of North American plant suppliers is uh, Florida Aquatic Nurseries, and um, they're not. I'm not going to diss them or anything, but they don't have you know the catalog and the you know the range of tissue culture, especially the one two grow that Tropica have. So contact your retailer. Let them know if they're not aware that there's a Tropica facility now in North America and they can buy from direct and let them know. And if they're a good retailer, they'll listen to you, the customer, and you can get some awesome quality plants uh, that way. So uh, Tropica want to grow. Um, it's not an advert for Tropica, but I just, I'm just imparting my knowledge and my experience. They are, they are great. You get so much quantity in a pot. Um, the pot itself is uh, normal. Most of the species are kept in a, a nutrient rich liquid instead of a gel, which makes it much easier to prepare. And the, just the quantity you get, you know, fair enough, the size isn't so big as a regular kind of potted plant, but the amount of plants you get are smaller, but you get much more of them. So they do represent much better value for money. I'm just going to check that out the comments, guys. Make sure you've not got any uh, nasty trolls or anything. I do have a couple of mods on tonight, so uh, thanks to those guys. You know who you are. Okay, so many of you from all over the world. This is great. There's 281 of you watching right now. That's that's a real thrill for me. Thank you so much to everyone. If you are enjoying the content, guys, hit that like button. Help spread the word of aquascaping around the world. That's my passion. Okay, so I did I did put out a um, a kind of a notification earlier on my YouTube community tab, also my Facebook page and my Instagram that we would be doing this. And if, I did ask for uh, what topics would you like me to cover? Um, most of most of you just just ask specific questions, which I'm not going to answer right now because there's so many. But one big topic was um, the problems people have in the startup phase of their planted tank what, and what to look out for. So I'll just run through that because I think it is an important topic. And even if you're kind of a relatively experienced plant and tank owner, I might cover something that you've not considered and something that you can maybe part on to, to your friends, you know, and, and just sort of share this knowledge. So with planted tanks, we've already talked about the importance of uh, getting a lot of plants and making sure they're healthy. So when I say making sure they're healthy, I, I, that means actually going to the retailer, your shop, your store, and looking at them, physically inspecting them, 
Um, don't necessarily go in and grab them out of the out of the system because they might get a bit um, touchy. Um, but you can see, you can see, you can physically physically inspect the plant from a distance. You can see if the leaves are healthy. You can see if they've got algae. You can hopefully see the root structure. So you, obviously, you don't want to be buying plants with algae on straight away because that's going to introduce algae to your aquarium system from day one, which is a no-no. You also um, you want the plants to look healthy. They need to be like a vibrant green color if that's what their natural state is. Some might be red, um, but you certainly don't want to be seeing pale, translucent, or yellowing leaves. And also, a real good indicator is the is the root structure. So the roots should be bright white. If they're starting to look a bit brown, that means they're kind of on their way out. And if they're starting to look a bit sort of translucent, see throughy brown, that means they're they're pretty much dead. So avoid them at all costs. Now, a top tip for me would be to strike up a relationship with the store owner or the, or the staff member and ask them, you know, when do you get your next shipment of plants in? And, you know, you can guarantee if you go in that day or the day after, you can guarantee that those plants are going to be as fresh as possible and you're going to be on to a, a really great start. Um, the, the potential problem is if you wait a couple of weeks, if the plants have been in their holding tanks, which typically aren't the best conditions for the plants, so they're, they're pretty much kind of slowly dying in a lot of, in a lot of stores when they're kept in their systems, um, the potential is you're going to buy a plant that's not going to be very healthy. So just to recap, have a chat with the, the retail guy the staff member or the owner ask them when they get their shipment of plants in and then hopefully you can get there on that day or shortly afterwards and get the plants another option is if you have a good relationship with the, with the retailer and you're going to put a big plant order in let's say you're doing a new scape in a i don't know a 40 gallon breeder or whatever size aquarium you've got you know if you're buying more than sort of 10 20 30 pots then it's worthwhile actually given the, given the staff or the store owner a list of those plants and say look you know these are the plants i want please can you order them in for me and if 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 they're a good um if they're a good business then they'll look after you and they'll order those plants in specifically for you if they don't then i would look elsewhere or po possibly go mail order i'm not sure of the logistics of mail order in the us it is such a huge country um I'm guessing in the winter time it can be, you know, more detrimental, or in the real in the heat of summer in some in some sort of states, uh, plants can travel, you know, quite temperamentally. Um, but just you know, read the reviews of the website, check out, you know, who's the most reliable, and go that way. So, I think I've kind of hammered the point there. Make sure you plant uh, super healthily. So let's just have a look at the comments, guys. Just make sure everyone's okay. Okay, nearly 300 of you watching that's awesome what do you guys think to my tank here <laughs> i spent a couple of hours uh, maintaining it today and i will be doing a um uh cinematic uh cinematic special on it it's about it's 300 days old this aquascape now so i want to do a special kind of cinematic uh edition uh film of it so you can look forward to that hopefully tomorrow evening i'll be uploading that so that'll be exciting Okay, loads and loads of individual questions. I'm just going to just pick top three just to keep you guys uh, happy. Let's have a look. Uh, Wasso, Wasso Lol asks, which twin star LED do I recommend? Um, any of them are good. Uh, the E series aren't as strong as the S series. So if you're going sort of low or medium energy planted tank, then probably stick with the E series. If you've got, um, you know, if you want to go high energy, you know, you, injecting co2 dosing lots of fertilizers soil substrate lots of fast growing plants then you probably want to use the s series now they do do um they do adjustable legs now so you can get um you can buy a model which will fit most aquariums because they have these adjustable feet and they do the the 300 the 600 the 900 and any minute now the 1200 is coming out so you've got uh, one foot two foot three foot and four foot and also a dependent version so you can suspend them <clears throat> so if you've got the right mounting equipment, you can pretty much you've got a lighting solution for any pretty much any rimless tank. Um, hope that answers your question. Okay, let's do another question. Um, 
So, Pinaki, pal, did you participate in the IAPLC 2018? What's your rank? I did, and I came 486, I think. So, my aim was top 500, which I just about managed. So, um, yeah, I mean, competitions are a very interesting thing. I talked about contests on my last uh, Scape School Sunday, actually, I think. And do consider entering contests, guys. You know, it, is, it gives you a motivation. It gives you a goal to aim for. Um, it's just... It's just nice to have to create something for a specific goal, if you like. Now, not everyone's into that. Every, some people just want to keep a tank running long term and, you know, tinker with it and enjoy it for themselves. But a lot of people, especially more competitive people, and they want to take their aquascaping to the next level, entering contests is a really great idea. And it, it helps you also helps in a, in a community, in the community aspect as well. So um, a lot of a lot of guys now, and especially in America and Japan, they formed these kind of collectives where they have a, a small group of aquascapers that, that have a really tight community and they share each other's scapes with, you know, photos or in person, invite each other around each other's homes. And they can really give honest feedback to each other's scapes. And, you know, you might have uh, one one guy might be like super experienced and he can pass on this knowledge to, to those with less experience. And I just think it's a really great idea. Now, we don't have so much of that in the UK right now. I did start a Facebook group called Serious Scapers, which isn't very active. We do have UCAPS, UK Aquatic Plant Society as well, which is very active still, thankfully. But if if you're, you know, a lot of, I get a lot of messages from people that are really struggling to uh, find people with like-minded interests in their country. So, you know, use social media now. You know, it's an amazing tool and it's there it's there to be used it's there to take be taken you know it's there to exploit so you know create a facebook group invite your friends that might be into aquascaping you know and you know it could be a secret group a public group closed group or whatever um but yeah just just try and you know create this community where you can you know spread the aquascaping love and also you know learn from people and people can learn from you you know that's what it's all about and that's one of the great things about the internet and things like youtube you know right now i'm speaking to how many 286 people right now you know dropping some knowledge for you guys hopefully um so yeah the ioplc 486 not brilliant not my best result i think my best result was 169th which was i think it was 2009 and it was a crypt cryptocorini only layout i think i used 10 species of crypt and it was a big tank it was 100 gallon uh, yeah, it's 370 litres. So, yeah, just 100 gallon uh, aquascape, just crypts only with some wood and some rocks. Um, and it, yeah, it was my best ever result. And it's not surprisingly, crypts are still one of my one of my favourite plants of all time. OK, let's have a look at some more questions. David Shanahan, hello, how are you doing? I would shout out to everyone, but I'd. That would be me with a live stream. <laughs> it wouldn't be time for anything else. Oh, that's good to hear. Yeah, everyone. Some people are getting notified. Some people aren't. Uh, I don't know what's wrong with you. I think I think there's two billion users on YouTube. So I think to get a notification, hundred percent of the time is pretty good going. Um, it's just one of those things, really. Glad, glad. So many of you are watching. Um, okay, so let's talk about the next topic. I wanted to talk a bit more. I did I did do a, a live stream when I was in my hotel room in Denmark recently about CO2 and, and circulation. And I wanted to talk a bit more about that in more detail because it was a really popular topic. And I think circulation is one of those things that kind of get overlooked in a plant and tank. People uh, focus quite rightly on lighting and they and CO2 itself and fertilizer dosing substrates the plants themselves maintenance these are all really important topics but circulation I, I would say is, is right up there um, to put it very simply the higher energy your planted tank is so when I say higher energy I mean the more light it has the more CO2 the more nutrients the more plant growth everything's happening more quickly in that aquarium so it has a higher energy level the higher energy level you have, uh, the more circulation you need. So if you think about, so we've got my tank here. Let me just 
Oh, we've got a bit of a bad reflection there. That's from my um, my softbox. So here we've got my lily pipe. I've got an inline diffuser here. You can't quite see it. It's around here. So that CO2 gets pumped straight into this lily pipe here. Uh, micro bubbles are coming out of here really quickly, getting fired out, and they're hopefully getting all around the tank. Now that I've got a quite a powerful filter here. It's about 1400 litres per hour. It's about six or seven times turnover, and I always say, go, you know, aim for aim for ideally ten, but at least five times turnover. And what I mean by that is the aquarium's volume um, times by five liters per hour at least. So let's say this is a uh, let's say this is ninety gallons or three hundred liters. You want to be using a uh, five times ninety is four hundred and fifty. You want to be using a 450 gallons per hour filter at least to get decent circulation. So if we didn't, if we so only say you have a one times turnover, it's more than likely these these micro bubbles are going to come out of here, and they're probably just going to hit around here. So all these plants around here, they're going to be great, but these plants over here, they're not going to be fed at all. So these will be suffering. These will be doing great. The, the better these are doing. The, the the worse these do and you'll get you know die off and you'll get dead spots and that, that's why it's really important to have um you know good levels of circulation and the more light you have the more important that is as well and the, the, you, some of you may know about the, the the intrinsic balance that you need between lighting nutrients and co2 and circulation so lighting is like the primary driving force behind the growth so it's like it's like almost like the accelerator pedal okay so um you've got some plants in a tank you're absolutely bombarding it with loads of light you know let's say you've got you know a 10 gallon tank with you know 50 watts of led light on it that's that's high light very high light those plants are going to want to grow really really fast and they will grow really really fast until they run out of something now that could be uh, nutrients, so mic macro micronutrients or CO two. So you need to, if if you don't supply those nutrients or CO two, that light is going to be useless. The plant's going to really suffer. Algae is going to use that light. Algae is super attracted to unhealthy plants, which these plants will be if you're bombarding them with so much light and they haven't got enough food to grow. So this balance between light and nutrients and CO two is super important. And people kind of forget the importance of circulation. Plants can't move. They don't, you know, they're not like us. They move around and they go get, you know, some food and drink out the fridge. You know, they're, they're just there. So we have to get the nutrients to them. And the only way we can do that is by using circulation. So, you know, don't underestimate the importance of circulation. It, it's hard to have too much, you know, it gets to a point where, you might have so much circulation that you're, you know, the plants are completely sort of blown over in the in the breeze, you know, with turbulence. You don't want that because the plant's going to be mechanically stressed out. So what you can do is like use something like this. This is a lily pipe. You can actually put loads and loads of water through this really fast. And because of the design of the outlet, we call it a hydrodynamic effect. That water is actually going around that tank in a nice kind of with a laminar flow, which means like a broad flow rather than a direct kind of turbulent flow, if that makes sense. So circulation, really, really important. Helps to eliminate dead spots. Helps to um, avoid, you know, areas with low flow where you'll get accumulated detritus and organic waste. That's going to lead to algae and other nasty things, excess anaerobic bacteria and things like that. So, you know, Circulation is really important. Okay, someone's just dropped me a super chat. Steve Hughes, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Set up another planted marine tank. <laughs> yeah, we'll do. Okay. Sorry, sorry for the lagging, guys. Um, I can't do anything about it, I'm afraid. Hopefully it's not too bad. Okay, Paul Stevenson, can you supplement filter with wave makers? Yeah, definitely. So um, we power heads a very efficient way of getting more circulation around the aquarium. Uh, arguably, uh, you know, the the fil actually the mechanical fil the mechanical filtration is very important in a plant and tank because it keeps the water physically clean. Biological filtration 
in my opinion, isn't so important because the healthy plant growth is actually going to be using up a lot of well, all of the nitrogenous compounds. So most of you are probably aware of the nitrogen cycle. You know, start off with ammonia or ammonium, depending on your pH level. The lower the pH, the more in favor of ammonium it is. And then we go to the nitrite and then we get to the nitrates. Now, a plant's actual preferred nitrogen source is ammonium. So if you imagine um, a really, really efficient biological filter, which is actually converting ammonium into nitrite really efficiently, you kind of, the plant's almost like, oh, you know, it's not using that. So, you know, I actually, I, I never upgrade my biological filtration. I just usually use what comes with the filter. Sometimes I'll actually remove some of the biological uh, media in favor of more mechanical or even chemical media. So maybe carbon or purigen if I want that real crystal clear kind of water. So what I'm saying is, you know, biological filtration, you know, everyone, a lot of people, um, you know, obsessed about choosing the right biological media for their filter. We're actually in a heavily planted tank. It doesn't really matter. Trust me. Um, in my better tank, my 300 cube my aquascaper 300 cube i literally have a, a tiny little uh, it's actually an eheim surface skimmer with the the skimming portion removed it's just literally a tiny power head with a small sponge and that is all the filtration i'm using and it's not even by i wouldn't say it's biological because i clean that sponge out every day under tap water um the bet is not producing much waste and i'm doing big water changes a couple of times a week and the plant growth uh, is absolutely fantastic at removing you know ammonia and nit nitrite and nitrate so guarantee i can guarantee you test my water at any time there'll be no you know harmful levels of ammonia or nitrate in there so i'm digressing a little bit but just to kind of emphasize the point um that plants are super filters and going back to my very original point at the beginning of the stream plants provide so many health benefits uh, and aesthetic benefits let's face it they look pretty as well you know hopefully you can see uh, this quite nicely in, in the stream um they look beautiful and that, that's what got me into aquascaping to begin with you know i, I quite like uh, nature and being amongst nature and, and when i first bought my aquarium i knew a planted tank was where i wanted it to go and you know i'm going to show you something right now just excuse me a minute just got this book back i lent it to um to a friend james james wong some of you may have heard of him he was i've interviewed him a while ago for one of my youtube videos um anyone got this book let me know in the comments uh this book changed my life this book is why i'm here right now this book uh, made me an aquascaper and it's written by Takashi Amano. It was uh, the first book I ever read of his and it absolutely blew my mind. I got it for Christmas one year and I opened it up and I literally, I was just like, oh my goodness. So actually the, the scapes now are, are relatively outdated. They're not very groundbreaking. But back then, you know, we're talking like late, late 80s, early 90s. Takashi Amano absolutely revolutionized uh, aquascaping. And I regard him as the godfather of, of modern aquascaping. And for me, it was like, I, I didn't realize that you could create these be beautiful underwater sort of scenes. And it just, I just thought this is, a, this is the direction I want to take my hobby. And yeah, and, that, and that's where and it just kind of evolved from there. I will do, and when I, if and when I get to 100k subscribers, I will do a very special video about my journey. Um, you know, from hobbyist to, to where I am now. And that is definitely uh, that book, Nature Aquarium book, uh, Nature Aquarium World book one by Takashi Amano. It's fundamentally the, the reason um, that I'm now a full-time aquascaper. Okay, I'm just going to look at some more comments, guys. Uh, hi, hi, Christian. Uh, Christian DeMarco set up a scape for him, an Aquascaper 900, I think it was. Uh, how far is the inlet uh, adjuster? It's halfway, exactly halfway I have it, which seems to work really well on my filter. It doesn't mean that will work well for your filter. It depends on the on the power 
uh, of your filter. So it just just to test and adjust. There's no like set set amount for everyone. It, it just depends on how powerful your filter is, and and that will depend on um, the media it's in there, how clean it is, obviously the rating of the of the actual pump itself. So there we go. Uh, Bartek. Do I think it's necessary to use power sand, sand under Tropica soil? Absolutely not. No, I've used Tropica soil exclusively now since it was released probably four years ago or so, five years, and never used power sand underneath it uh, with no issues. Welsh Weeks, how are you? Bert Engbers, what about the Dutch Masters? That is a really good point. Let me show you something. I love Dutch aquascaping. I just find it really, really hard. Uh, maybe I'm a bit lazy. I think Nature Aquarium. Nature Aquarium is a um, more kind of forgiving style. There's no kind of set rules per se, whereas the Dutch is very formal. You're relying on like really kind of um, it's very rules driven. So you have distinct kind of you know amount of species per length of aquarium. You know, make, make sure the contrast between the plants next to each other is okay. Make sure the textures and everything like this. So it's it's a lot more, I would say it's a lot potentially more inaccessible to to potential aquascapers. People, you know, people don't necessarily want to be uh, governed by a, a tight set of rules. Um, you know, in my opinion, aquascaping is about uh, expression, freedom of expression. Um, and for me personally, the nature aquarium style is just something that really kind of resonates with with my taste and my overall kind of philosophy. Um, but there's, uh, I'm digressing. Dutch Masters, um, I'm, I'm friends with uh, Bart Lawrence and Willem Willem van Vetzel in 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 uh, in the Netherlands in Holland. I've visited their homes. I've filmed their aquariums. I'm very privileged to do that, and. I'm hoping I've got the picture here somewhere. Oh, I can't find it. Oh, no, here it is. So I wonder if you guys can see this. This is Bart's tank. A recent, a recent screenshot. Let's see if how is that going to focus on there. So you can see that, guys. It's very pretty. It's it's very kind of formal. Um, it's not doing it justice, really. I'm afraid. Um. But the Dutch masters, yeah, the, the, the Dutch scapes have their place. There is a Dutch category in the Aquatic Gardeners Association International Aquascaping Contest, which I think is great. And yeah, if you want a real challenge and you want to real kind of learn how to grow plants um, and really focus on, you know, this kind of formal uh, rules driven kind of aquascaping technique, then the Dutch Dutch style is the way to go for sure. Hello from Pittsburgh. Awesome. Yeah, I've uh, just doing Florida. I have done a paludarium. Uh, there is a video on my channel. If you just search insularium, so instead of paludarium, insularium, I-N-S-U-L-A-R-I-U-M, uh, you can find a video on that. So lots of stuff coming out the top of the tank, etc. Really cool. Okay, I've got some lots of sort of like quite detailed tech, technical questions. Um, BBA, <laughs> it's a nightmare, isn't it? Yeah, water changes, just focus on really healthy plant growth and that hopefully will get you rid, rid of any algae in the longer term. Someone's just bought an Aquascaper 600. Awesome, awesome tanks. My favorite size, the Aquascaper 600. Uh, Snow asks, do, have I ever kept Glosso stigma? Yes. Yes, I have. Go on Google and search Mother Microsorum and you'll see my first ever aquascape. I think it was 2004, 2005. Basically a huge Java fern with a carpet of Glosso around it. And it was my first serious attempt at aquascaping. I was really proud of it. And it was the growing Glosso back then was like a real big deal in the UK. Quite actually hard to find it. And a friend of mine sent me um, some cuttings from his carpet and I managed to propagate it and, and, and grow on a full carpet. So that was awesome. 
Uh, someone's asking me about liquid carbon. Um, yeah, it's a real, a real kind of controversial topic, liquid carbon. So for those that don't know, some, some of it's marketed as liquid CO2, liquid carbon booster, easy carbo. There's lots, Seacom XL, um, loads and loads of these products all very similar. They all contain an active ingredient, glutahaldehyde or something very similar. Now, if you do a, a search for glutahaldehyde, don't ask me to spell it to you, <laughs> but you, you just search liquid carbon harmful effects or something like this, you'll see stuff. It's nasty. I'm not going to. I'm not going to, you know, lie to you. It's not a nice chemical. You don't want to be inhaling it. You certainly don't want to be touching it. And um, it's just it's just not very nice. And it, it's marketed as a liquid CO two, but actually. It, there's no actual evidence that it improves plant growth. It does. It is an algae side. It's a bio side. It will kill algae, but it also will kill other things if it's overdosed. Um, it's just a nasty thing. So I personally, I never use it anymore. I used to use it before I knew better, um, but I'm good friends with it with a few people that know uh, know a lot more about it than me. You know, professional chemists, etc. And yeah, personally, I don't use it, and I don't. I never recommend using it anymore um, either. Harry Robinson, what's your favorite aquascape you have created and why? Do you know what? This is one of them because it's super easy. It's all low, low tech plants. You can grow these without CO2, although I do use CO2. I only do a water change on here now, probably once a month. I do top up, uh, top up with tap water, which is a little bit naughty because the actual the mineral content will grow, gradually increase. But once a month, I do a huge water change, you know, sort of 80, 90%. Um, so I love it. I mean, it's growing and really mature. It's gonna. It's nearly like a well, it's over it's just over ten months old now. Three hundred days old. Um, coming up to its first birthday, uh, pretty much on New Year's Eve, and yeah, it's just a beautiful home for the fish. You know, the harlequins and the pearl gouramis. And if you can see the pearl gouramis in there, they're all a little bit camera shy by the look of it. Um. They love it in there. The cherry shrimp are breeding like crazy. The plant health really good. There's no nuisance algae, uh, very few pest snails. And it's just a really nice addition to my living space. Um, you know, that this, for me, it's all about kind of uh, effort versus reward. So this is maximum reward for, for minimum effort, basically. Like I said, once a month. It looks great probably for one or two weeks. Then it kind of slowly deteriorates. I get algae on the glass. The plants are looking a little bit sorry for themselves. And then when I do the water change, you start getting on top of the fertilizer and stuff. It looks great again. And then so it's kind of like a bit of a, you know, like this. But overall, really happy with it. Fish are super healthy. Plants are healthy. Um, you know, what more can you ask for? It's, it's a really lovely scape. I'm really proud of it. Okay, this is a good question. Uh, hi, George. Any experience of the Twin Star Nano Sterilizer? Thoughts? I have used a Twin Star Nano Sterilizer, and I, I've not done enough tanks with it and without it to have any kind of real evidence of, of um, you know, quantifiable evidence that it's of success. But I believe it will help prevent algae in the early days. So I think it, they're more useful for using for a brand new setup when algae is super likely. Um, I don't know exactly how it works. I think it's something to do with the tiny uh, nano bubbles um, attaching themselves to the green algae cells and destroying them like that. So it helps to prevent a green algae buildup. I do have a spare one actually in in the cabinet down here, believe it or not, and I am getting quite quick build up of green algae on the glass so i am tempted to try it out and see see how it does what they definitely do is produce oxygen which is a good thing and if, if you were watching right from the beginning of the stream um then you know you'll know that oxygen is a great thing for the aquarium system not just great for the fish and the inverts if you keep an inverts but great for the filter bacteria so it's just great for the whole system, more oxygen. So, you know, they're not they're not the cheapest product in the world, but they do look great. You know, they're well designed. They've kind of got this Apple kind of style going on with the with the minimalist sort of uh, white packaging, etc. 
they're not, not an offensive thing in the aquarium. They, I think they look really cool seeing this kind of mist of nanobubbles going around the tank every so often. Uh, but it's up to you guys. You know, I'm not going to say definitely get them. They're the best thing ever. Equally, I'm not going to say they're a load of rubbish. You know, I use them with success and a lot of other people do as well. So, yeah, it's up to you guys. It's up to you how you spend your money. Um, the jury's out whether or not they really do have an effect on algae. Yeah, 300, yeah, 317 people watching. This is really cool. If you are enjoying the content, guys, please give me a, a thumbs up. It helps to get that video kind of spread around the YouTube space, uh, which helps to execute my mission of promoting aquascaping, which would be perfect if you are enjoying this in the content and you think other people can benefit uh, from you know what I'm talking about. Uh, KJ, could you share some knowledge on immersed growth? Definitely. So immersed growth. So almost, I would say 95% of aquarium plants in nature will grow out of water. They prefer to grow out of water. And the reason for that is they have much more access to CO2 in the air, got more access to light. They, they're more robust. So they're physically more kind of strong because they've got to support their own body weight in the air. And majority of the time in nature, they are growing out of water. Now, what happens in the wild the, the flood seasons will come the rainy seasons will come the plants bec the plants become flooded and the plant then has to adapt to its submersed growth or a submersed growth or underwater growth and actually the plant some plants can have a really tricky time doing that so uh, some plants a lot of you may have experienced die off so you'll buy you'll buy an immersed plant from your shop you know and you'll take it home and it will have to go through its adaption phase. Now, if it's not a super healthy plant to start with, and we talked about this earlier on in the in the stream, buy the healthiest plants you can from the start. If it's not super healthy to start with, it can struggle to adapt. So immersed growth in terms of um, what, I'd, what, I'd like to, what I'd like to talk about is how they're grown in the nurseries. So in the greenhouses, say I've got a lot of experience with Tropica. I do a lot of work with Tropica now. They grow their plants either tissue culture in laboratory conditions, the ones who grow, or immersed, vast majority are immersed out of water. Some are submersed. These are fully aquatic species. These are plants that cannot grow out of water. So Vallisneria, uh lilies um what else is there kabomba you know there's other full aquatic species that they obviously have to be grown underwater so tropica and most other nurseries will grow their plants out of water now we talked about the reason for that is you know in nature they grow out of water they're physically more, more robust so for transportation they're going to be uh, more hardy in shipping so uh, when a plant adapts to underwater growth, it becomes super floppy. It becomes easily torn because the plant hasn't got to physically support itself in the water. The water is doing all that support for it. So if you think about transporting a submersed plant, you know, it's going to be a lot more prone to damage versus an immersed plant. So that's one reason. Another reason is this is a really interesting topic. OK, and I talked about this in some detail with actually Dustin's fish tank. You know, Dustin um, from his channel, he was at Aquatic Experience. He's setting up a new greenhouse. Now, I asked him, um, you know, are you going to grow immersed or submersed? And basically, he's going to grow submersed because his customers all struggle uh, with, uh, basically, uh, they're struggling with a die-off that they get from when they buy an immer immersed plant out of water. When it makes that transition to submersed, a lot of people are struggling. A lot of plants are dying off. So they, they buy submersed. Now, my argument is um, if you have a really healthy immersed plant, say from the Tropica nursery, and you're buying it soon after the shops received it from the nursery, that plant is super robust. And actually, it's more adaptable to a wider range of water conditions. So let's compare buying a submersed plant. Um, so let's say you buy a plant from a, a stockist that only, that only supplies submersed plant. Now you've got a pH of say 7.5, your water's really hard. Your supplier has grown this plant submersed in a pH of 6.5, his water's really soft. When you get that plant from your supplier and you put it in your tank, 
very, very likely that plant is going to die off. It's going to melt because it can't adapt to this huge difference in water chemistry. Now, if you bought that same species of plant and it was healthy and it was in its immersed condition, I can absolutely guarantee you that that plant would adapt much better than it would versus the submersed, the underwater growth form. So I hope that I hope some of you might have learned something there. It's a really important topic and it's you know something that I really uh, try to get across to people. Don't be uh, fearful of buying immersed plants because if you buy them in their healthy state and the They've just got them from the nursery. Like I said, have a chat with the staff. When do you get your plants in, guys? You know, yeah, we get them every Wednesday. Go in on Wednesday. Wait for them to come in. Get them straight away when they're super healthy. And then they're going to be much more adaptable. Now, so that's that's immersed. I want to go back to the tissue culture, especially the tropical ones who grow, which are grown in, the majority of them now are grown in this liquid, uh, liquid growth medium, which is fantastic. And actually, the plant, is, is in its submersed form already. But because of this nutrient-rich jelly, it's actually super adaptable. So no matter what your growth conditions are, you can pretty much guarantee if it's if you've got the appropriate kind of growth conditions in your aquarium, you know, if you've got appropriate lighting, if you've got CO2, if you need CO2, you know, decent liquid fertilizers, decent soil, substrate, etc., you can guarantee that tropical one two grow plant or whatever other tissue culture plant you've got, if it's a good quality plant, will adapt almost immediately to your water conditions and start growing straight. Honestly, I've got, I wish I could switch, switch the uh, screen round. In my better tank, I bought, uh, I actually bought a pot of Rotala bonsai today. Uh, shout out Aquarium Gardens. Thanks for the discount. <laughs> um, I, it was all kind of I don't know if you guys are aware of Tropical 1-2 grow pots, but they are super compact. The the plants are almost contorted and twisted around each other because they're like they're jam packed in their pot. There's hundreds and hundreds of plants in this this little one little pot, and because they're grown in this pot, they're all kind of twisted. So when you plant them, they all look a bit sorry for themselves. They all look a bit distorted and you know bent over, etc. But literally within a few hours, I, 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 I want to show you right now. I'll show you in a video another time. Um, from going like growing like this and like all kind of twisted around, they're all like this. They're all growing straight up, and I can guarantee in a few days I'll see new growth. And yeah, I hope that kind of addresses some of your concerns about immersed growth. Um, and it also reinforces the fact why I like tissue culture plants so much, especially the Tropica one two grow. Yeah. Okay, James. Just do tissue culture, then you'll have nothing to worry about, including pond snails. Very. Yeah, that's very true, James. Um, it is. Uh, yeah. If you start off with a completely sterile tank, brand new soil, brand new hardscape, and and one hundred percent tissue culture plants, you will never get snails. You only get snails if you introduce them accidentally by snail eggs on a plant or hardscape or substrate. So to avoid this cross-contamination, yeah, start off with a brand new tank, brand new substrate, brand new hardscape, brand new tissue culture plants, and you won't get any snails. And you'll get less algae as well. You'll get less algae on startup. Yeah, I've got some commentary on Tropica being heavily overpriced. I think that depends on the location. Um, it certainly isn't overpriced here in the UK. Green Aqua are here. Yay! Hi, Victor. Great to see you on here, mate. Thanks for joining. Yuri's is watching as well. Thanks, buddy. Okay, guys, I'm going to give it another 10 minutes or so. Um, I was planning on half an hour, but it's been such a good engagement. We've had consistently 300 viewers uh, throughout the stream, which is absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, it's really great to know uh, that you guys are listening and, and hopefully learning as well. And do consider giving me a thumbs up if you can. Um, not not just to sort of give me an ego boost, well, that, that's obviously brilliant, uh, but to help share. Um, if you hit the thumbs up, then YouTube knows that it's a video worth watching and then hopefully other people will pick it up in the longer term. So this video will be watch, you know, watchable in the long term. Um, I will keep it on my, on my video uh, library so you can watch it whenever you want to. 
hopefully I've imparted some real kind of gems of knowledge, you know, um, especially about the immerse, submerse growth, how Tropica do their thing with the, you know, the one, two grow. Um, going back to the basics about how plants really enrich uh, an aquarium system, extra not extra oxygen, less algae. You know, let's go. Let's talk about algae for a few minutes because it's the number one topic I get asked. If I could count how many times I've been asked about algae, um, yeah. So the, the number one thing I would suggest to deal with algae is to prevent it from happening in the first place. Much easier uh, to prevent things from happening, you know, that, rather than dealing with them once they've happened, which is easy to say, right? You know, we always we get algae and. You know, uh, hindsight's a wonderful thing. So to prevent algae, you need to focus really, really heavily on these on this super healthy plant growth. So to do that, we need appropriate lighting. So not too much, not too little. And that depends on the species of plant you want to grow, basically. So too much light and you're going to get algae. Uh, too little light and the plant's not going to grow. And they probably get algae again. Um, and then you need to think about CO2. Uh, do you need CO2? I would always recommend, see, if you have a planted tank and you have the resources, the budget, the willingness, I would always go for CO2 injection if you can. It really, really helps the plants grow. 40% of a plant, around about 40% of a plant, physical matter is, is carbon. Like us, we're carbon-based life forms. Now, for a plant to grow, it has to get more carbon in. And the easiest way for it to do that is via CO2, carbon dioxide. So if we can add more carbon to the water, that plant can grow much quicker, much more easily. So lighting, CO2 and other nutrients. So when I say other nutrients, I mean macro and micronutrients. So the macronutrients, let's see how good my knowledge is. So the macronutrients will be nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, calcium, sulfur, Carbon, which is the biggest one, which people seem to forget. Carbon is a huge uh, macronutrient. And what else have we got in the macros? I think that's it. Sulfur, I said. Calcium, calcium, magnesium, yeah. And then we've got the micronutrients. So we've got iron, molybdenum, boron, copper, uh, manganese. And I think there might be a couple more. Uh, nickel, maybe. Zinc. Yeah. So... The, the plants, all plants need all of these nutrients in different kind of ratios. Now, there's a quite a few uh, liquid fertilizers on the market which have an ideal ratio of these nutrients. So um, just a shameless plug. Evolution Aqua, the Aquascaper uh, complete liquid plant food will contain all the nutrients you need in one handy bottle. Just for ease of reference, I dose one cap full of this in there every day and tropica specialized as well which is an all-in-one and there's lots of others dennis wong got his own one out there's nicole g there's tnc complete um all very similar products so that's that that's my recommendation is to go for a liquid fertilizer like that um i think even aquarium co-op do theirs uh, i think dustin's got his own now so there's there's so many out there on the marketplace just go go for whatever is easiest available to you um so we talked about lighting, CO2, nutrients. We talked about circulation earlier on in the stream. You know, aim for this five to ten times turnover. If you've got a high energy tank, more lighting, more nutrients, etc. You need more circulation. You need those plants to get those nutrients. Otherwise, you'll get dead spots and then you'll get algae. And then one of the biggest things which we haven't talked about, and I will do a complete stream on this all to itself, is maintenance. You know, a planted tank will only look good or an aquascape will only look good if you maintain it that way so by maintenance i mean regular water changes you know schedule these water schedule these water changes into your weekly routine so ideally you know i'm a bit lazy on this now i just like to do a water change once a month but that's because it's so super stable you know minimum livestock great plant growth conditions etc but in the vast majority of aquascapes i would recommend at least one 50 water change a week now the reason for the water changes is is a, is a, is a few reasons the first one, and I would say the most important one, is to limit the accumulation of waste organics. Now, what will happen is plants produce waste as well as the fish. A lot of people overlook this fact. You know, plants excrete waste matter. 
you know all living things excrete waste matter now it's a closed system so there's nowhere for this waste matter to go it can be kind of recycled in the long term but in the shorter term you know these this, this waste accumulated matter will build up and eventually it will lead to algae so by doing these big weekly water changes it helps limit this accumulation helps keep the aquarium system fresh and it will help limit the algae another reason is if we're dosing a decent liquid fertilizer some people use the estimative index of dry chemicals absolutely fine in fact this system is based on that kind of philosophy of deliberately or over, slightly overdosing nutrients every day so we dose it every day and then we do a big water change, a 50% minimum water change once a week. And then what that does, it resets the nutrient levels. So you, you start from scratch again. So the nutrient levels kind of gradually creep up through the week. You do a big water change and then they dip down. They gradually creep up. And then you end up with a, you know, hopefully a fairly kind of flat nutrient curve like this over time. And the plants will stay super healthy, healthy plants, less algae, hopefully. So maintenance, we we'll talk about maintenance and a whole new topic all to itself another time. <clears throat> so that's kind of the, the fundamental ways to uh, address algae. Appropriate lighting, good CO2 levels ideally, good nutrient levels, good circulation, good maintenance. We talk about substrates on another live stream as well. That's worth a whole new live stream to itself. Now, it's the last sort of three or four minutes now, guys. I'm going to look through the comments section to see if there's any pertinent questions that I can answer for you. Emma? How's Tommy? Is he asleep? Oh, okay. I wanted to introduce you guys to Tommy. Some of you may have seen him on a on one of my uploads recently um but i am going to try to do a, a little kind of five second snippet of him at the intro to every video at least once a week and you'll get to see him growing up over over the months and years hopefully so um he's a, he's a new family member but we love him to bits um awesome personality super intelligent he's already well most of the time he's doing his toilet business in the garden he's fetching balls and he's yeah he's great i can't wait to introduce him to you guys properly I can't show you, Tommy. He's having a little sleep, bless him. I should definitely show you on the next live stream, I promise. <clears throat> oh, just a little heads up as well. Uh, I'm going to be meeting up with Yuri's next week. Uh, so shout out to Yuri's. I think he's watching right now. If those that don't know, uh, Yuri's has a, a very fast-growing, great YouTube channel. His, his content is amazing. So do check it out if you haven't already. And we'll be doing some form of collaboration, uh, at least one or two videos together uh, whilst we're at Tropica. And maybe when we're in our, I think we're sharing an Airbnb together. So we'll probably do something there as well, maybe a live stream. So you can look forward to that, guys. Um, okay, let's have a couple of more minutes. Gamekeeper6, hi, George. What plants do you recommend for a hill stream tank? That's a really good question. Hillstream, I definitely go for what we call rheophyte plants. So these are plants that naturally occur in fast-flowing rivers. So you want to be maybe thinking about Bucophalandra, maybe even Anubias, Bulbitis, Java ferns, plants that are going to, you know, withstand, you know, physically robust to be able to withstand, you know, large amounts of flow. You could even have them maybe half immersed, half submersed, and hopefully like the water splashing is going to stop them from drying out. That, that would be my preference. Maybe some mosses as well. Um, but because if, especially if they're growing immersed, they're going to grow really healthy. We talked about immersed growth already. <clears throat> they have more access to CO2 in the air, more access to the light, less algae. Uh, that would be something I would go for. Try to go for this kind of immersed thing. That would be really cool. Okay, guys. Uh, thank you so much again for, for watching. Don't forget to give me a thumbs up if you can, if you've enjoyed the content. Uh, I'm pretty overwhelmed by how many comments there are. I'm, apologies for not answering all of your questions. Um, I hope you enjoyed the live, live stream. Uh, if you have enjoyed it, give me a thumbs up. Share it if you can. That'd be awesome. Uh, I'm guessing most of you have subscribed already, but if you haven't, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell. 
and hopefully you'll get notified every time you upload a new video. Um, I'm going to be filming this tomorrow, super high-end B-roll cinematic special, which I'm really excited about. Put some really funky music to it and have a really nice, uh, enjoyable experience watching that, hopefully. Um, got some exciting plans to talk to you about. My black water tank, my better tank's looking great. My budget tank is looking horrendous. Uh, I'm, I'm going to film it in its state because I just want to show you how bad a tank can look and hopefully how I can uh, rescape it, you know, with minimum budget, etc. But yeah, lots more content to uh, look forward to uh, on my channel. So stay tuned. Okay, I'm going to sign off there, guys. Thank you so much for watching again. You take care. Keep on scaping. Cheerio.